I'd just like to go back to the, the, the point where Darwin realized that uh, evolution was a fact. And he, and he had sufficient material actually to realize, especially with the age of the Earth, from another source. Uh, uh, what happened in his head when he's, he had to decide that he didn't, well, did he become an atheist in his head? What, how, right. what about that stark con conflict? Yes, D Darwin lost his religion, but he lost it gradually. It, didn't, it wasn't a sudden blinding reverse road to Damascus. Uh, he, he was a Christian, of course, when he was um, studying for the church, and uh, he remained pretty devout, I think, during most of the time on the Beagle. Uh, when he got back and started working out the theory of evolution, he gradually lost his religious faith, partly because of his science, but also for more personal reasons. Um, he reacted with revulsion to the doctrine that people who didn't believe in religion would go to hell. He said this would condemn to eternal torment uh, my father, my brother, and most of my friends, and this is a damnable doctrine. He also uh, lost his faith partly because of personal tragedy, most notably the death of his beloved daughter Annie at the age of 10 from complications after scarlet fever, and uh, he had other tragedies in his life. Uh, he also was impressed by the tragedy of natural selection itself, in a way, because, um, as he said, I, 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 I cannot Im imagine a benevolent, a, a beneficent deity creating the ichneumonidae. The ichneumonidae are a group of wasps that lay their eggs, they're parasitoid wasps that lay their eggs in in um, other insects like caterpillars and the larvae and, and they sting them so that they're paralyzed but not killed and the larvae then eat them from inside um, and this is just one example of the immense cruelty of the natural world and Darwin not only saw that the natural world was cruel he also saw that that cruelty was integral to the entire theory of natural selection I think all these things combined to, um, to rid Darwin of his religious faith. What I interests me is the history of the Earth and timing of events is wonderfully more accurate than in Darwin's time. What I puzzle about is, are, are the mechanisms of natural selection and so on compatible with this history? I mean, is it efficient enough or might it be far too efficient? Okay, that's a very interesting question. Um, I suppose by efficiency, you kind of mean, um, is it powerful enough to drive evolution in the time available? Something, something like that. Um, because you might think, I'm thinking aloud now, you might think that um, although major things, death of, of animals that are obviously completely incompetent to live, that's a sort of natural selection we can understand. But is natural selection really efficient enough, powerful enough to explain tiny little things, the, the shape of our ears, the, the, the fact that we've got eyebrows? Um, can you really think that natural selection is efficient enough, the survival of the fittest is efficient enough to give us eyebrows? What, what good are eyebrows? Do they perhaps stop the sweat running down your brow into your eyes? And if so, does that really make the difference between life and death? Do, do animals, do, do humans really die because sweat runs into their eyes? Well, yes, they, it, they probably do, if you think about it like this. Suppose you're running away from a saber-toothed tiger, or suppose you haven't yet seen the saber-toothed tiger, but it's crouching in the bushes there, and one individual has eyebrows and therefore doesn't have sweat running into his eyes. And another individual next to him has eyebrows and therefore does not have sweat running into his eyes. Which one's going to spot the saber tooth first? Well, that's a crude example, but it's the kind of thing that we, we probably need to postulate in order to explain the evolution of relatively trivial things. And yes, natural selection is powerful enough because if you think about it, it's not just this one incident of the two individuals, one that has eyebrows and the other doesn't. There are, there are genes for having eyebrows. 
and they're distributed right the way through an enormous gene pool so that by statistical sampling, the difference between an individual that has eyebrows and one that doesn't, that has a gene for making eyebrows and one that doesn't, by statistical repetitive sampling, the gene for making eyebrows does actually come out ahead because the gene pool is so large and because the number of generations through which it is winnowed is also very large. You've mentioned that uh, Darwin was uh, galvanized into action in 1858 when he got the letter from Wallace, which I believe more or less summarized exactly his own 1844 draft. A bit of conjectural history. What if Darwin had never had that letter from Wallace? Would he have ever gone public? It's arguable that if Darwin had never had the letter from Wallace, he would have gone on writing his great book, which um, I suppose might have been published before his death. In the event, it never was published. Uh, but um, that was Darwin's eventual ambition. So I don't know. It's one of those counterfactual historical speculations that, um, that um, are, are fun to play about with. But I don't know of any actual evidence um, that, that could uh, that allow me to answer the question, what would have happened if Wallace had not written that letter? Or, I mean, Wallace might, instead of writing to Darwin, Wallace might have sent the letter directly to the editor of Nature. Uh, and it might have, uh, Darwin might have seen it first in print, uh, rather than, it was in, in, in a way, a piece of serendipitous luck that the one man in England that Wallace chose to send his discovery to was Darwin. And, and he sent it to Darwin because Darwin was a famous naturalist and he thought Darwin was probably the best equipped to appreciate it, which he was. <laughs>